Hello, my name is Glenn Hall. Today is January 23rd, 2024. Uh, this message is called, At Easter, the idle church will be swept to destruction. This is a prophetic word. Uh, I urge you to pray for ears to hear, for eyes to see, because things are imminent. I believe they will happen shortly. <clears throat> it was 11 days ago that I received a prophetic word from Christine Beadsworth. She's a prophetess uh, who lives in South Africa. And it was just the audio podcast and the uh, transcript came a few days later. <clears throat> and I was not able to really digest everything until after I received the transcript. And she ended up releasing a total of four transcripts over and podcasts over a few days. I want to begin this by just telling you the gist of um, the vision that God gave her. She was out walking, considering a previous prophecy God had given her. And suddenly she had a vision of a banquet, a banqueting table filled with um, lovely foods. She likened it to a table in the Middle East that is just filled with all kinds of lovely dishes, uh, both fresh and older, like fermented foods and things like that. <clears throat> And then, as she began to contemplate that vision of the, the groaning board, the groaning table, as she put it, filled with food, the Lord gave her another vision, which was of a, a DNA strand with two sides, the double helix, the two sides of the DNA strand of man. And then after that, he gave her a vision of a, um, atomic blast or the fission of the causing of an atom to explode. So there were three major aspects to this, um, word that, that she brought forth. And the food itself, I believe, represents the words that God has given to Christine over a number of years. And as she interpreted the dream or the, the vision, she went back to some of her earlier words back in 2019. Uh, especially there were two major words in 2019 that I'm remembering. And then she began to explain what the, um, what the parts of the vision meant. The Lord brought to her recollection a specific dream she had had in 2019. That was a dream where there were a lot of children playing in a river. It was very hot outside and Christine noticed that suddenly several portals opened in the mountains beyond the river and began to flow down into the river. And then another group of portals opened up and began to flow down. So there were a total of seven portals. She knew that those people would be drowned unless she warned them. And so she yelled out a warning. And there was a small child there that she noticed on the beach that she knew would not make it if she didn't help it. So she picked up this uh, child and carried it into a hotel. 
She said that as she came into the hotel in her dream, she thought, wow, this would be a great place for a wedding. And in the midst of this dream, God began to bring it forward to the vision she had just had of the table, the DNA, and the nuclear explosion. And he began to teach her what uh, the meaning was of those things she had seen in the, um, the dream she had had four and a half years ago or so. As she was considering what this vision meant, the Lord showed her that regarding the DNA strand, or the, the DNA, double helix, one strand, one side of it represented the woman and the man-child of Revelation chapter 12. She said the other strand represented the dragon from Revelation chapter 12. <clears throat> Then the Lord revealed to her that the splitting of a DNA strand is like the explosion of a nuclear bomb. As she saw the the vision of the nuclear explosion. She explained how men create nuclear fission and likened it to the place where the remnant, God's remnant, is right now. She said, we are in a holding pattern, and she was actually contemplating that word because God had given her that word about 10 days before this. And she said it was just like when protons bombard the nucleus of an atom. The nucleus seems to contract and go backward just before it explodes. And she said, so it is for the remnant right now. I believe so it is for the overcomers right now. This holding pattern will soon cease and there will suddenly be and these are her words, an incredible release of the power of the seven spirits of God. Christine received this word on January 7th. She did not release it until January 12th because she was seeking God for understanding about what everything meant. Well, on the day that Christine decided to release this word, someone sent her a picture of a nuclear explosion. This picture is what I've chosen to put as the picture for this video. And the picture of the, it was an actual picture of a nuclear explosion. And you, if you look at it, you'll see that there is a rainbow of seven colors that surrounds the explosion. Now, Christine interpreted this as being a fulfillment of Joel chapter 2, uh, with the first partial fulfillment having happened back in the, the book of Acts, in Acts chapter 2. I do not think that that is what her vision represents. What I believe it represents is the glorification of the man-child, and that is what is spoken of in Revelation chapter 12. Now, as Christine was considering the meaning of this, these visions, God drew her memory back to the dream he had given her four and a half years ago. 
in 2019. And I want to read a few things from her transcript about that. So actually this was five years ago. So she said it was on the 22nd of January, 2019. In the dream, it was unbearably hot and people were seeking relief in rivers and pools. And I watched from a distance a group of children venturing into the river, but scurrying back quickly in case there was something dangerous in the water. Then I moved through some kind of hotel. There was a big room and people were sitting around in loungers and guests in the hotel were sitting around drinking coffee, talking, and there was a banqueting table with chocolate egg type desserts on platters lying around. I followed a waitress through a side door to the outside The door emerged high up in midair with only one big step, and I thought to myself, this would be a great place for a bride to make her entrance at a wedding. In the garden, which was a flat valley with a row of mountains on the left, there were many, many people. It was a hot, sunny day, and as I went quickly in the direction I had intended, suddenly I heard a loud bang, and I looked up, and multiple portals had broken open in the mountain range on the left, and water was gushing out in mighty waterfalls out of each one. There was a helicopter hovering above the gushing water. I turned around and I started running, passing people who were completely unaware of what was happening. I passed children and I told them to run, and then the little boy was just standing, staring at the sight, and I knew he would never make it, that he would never be able to outrun the water. So I scooped him up and began to run again, yelling to everyone, including his friends, run, run, look up, run. And as they realized what had happened, they began to run. Then there was another loud bang, and the mountains broke open in another area further along. And there were three or four more openings, like hidden gates opening or breaking, and more waters began pouring out. And I felt a great sadness in the dream, as I knew the little children I had seen playing in the river earlier would all be swept away. The entrance to the hotel was congested with people trying to flee to safety inside. And so I took a different route, which was actually straight ahead of me. It was a grassy, leaf-littered pathway covered by an overhanging avenue of trees, and it led to the front garden of the hotel. I went inside easily as no one had come this way, and I went to a man who was waiting in a room that had been prepared for people that would arrive. I set the little boy down, and I said through the glass wall from the room next door that I would help him. But at that moment, a man in authority in the hotel came in and told the man in the prepared room to take charge of the people arriving. I was irritated that he ignored me, so I said, well, I'll do the next room. I stood and watched a pack of people herding into the door of the hotel, and I was overwhelmed with horror, as I knew that many of my nearest and dearest had perished, and I said loudly, oh God, it's the dream, it's the dream. I woke up from that dream, traumatized. Later on that day, the day I'd had the dream, the Lord began to explain and interpret the dream to me. He said, On the day after the wedding, I will cause my mountains to break forth. I will open the portals of the ancient aqueducts of my spirit stored deep beneath the earth. And God continued, You will play the part of carrying the man-child during this time and bringing him to the inner chamber. Who carries the man-child? The woman carries the man-child. The reason the manager did not speak to you is because you were invisible. The place of safety, the garden room, is the Garden of Eden, where my overcomers can enter and be fed. And I said, Lord, why was I so shocked then in this dream? Is this a good thing? And he said, you were, you were overcome with the knowledge that many close to you have not prepared themselves sufficiently. For those who are righteous, my judgments are not something to fear, for they bring recompense and reward. And I said, Lord, all those children were swept away. How terrible. And he said, yes, my daughter, but my children have played in the river for long enough. They should have spent the time preparing and making themselves ready.
Then he said, In the dream you thought of the flood of judgment that comes and is at the door. Oh, I said, so it's a flood of judgment? Not a literal flood? It's both, my daughter, first the natural and then the spiritual. Talking about natural and spiritual flooding. So judgment in the natural of a, uh, a kind that is going to hurt people, and then a flood in the spirit, which will be a, a, flood, of, a flood of the Holy Spirit's power. So why did you give me this dream this morning, Lord? I asked him, and he said, I wanted to show you the sequence of timing and the multitudes in the valley of decision. First, the breaking forth, and then the scooping up of the man-child, and passage along the glory, the avenue of glory to the garden. What does the hotel represent, Lord? I asked. He said, It is the modern church, who feast when they should fast, and hold entertainment upon entertainment, and lie exhausted from drink in the morning of the day of the Lord. They are the guests at the wedding. Now, you know, the church teaches that everybody is the bride of Christ. Well, they aren't. There are different levels of people who will be at the wedding. There will be the man-child who will be friends, brothers of the bridegroom. There will be the bride and there will be the guests at the wedding. So that was the dream that I was reminded of when I was walking around the block on January 7th. So remember, God reminded her of this dream after she had her vision on January 7th. So then I said, Lord, what are you saying by reminding me of this dream? What is the connection to nuclear fission? What's the connection of this dream she had five years ago on January 22nd, 2019 to nuclear fission? And God said, quote, at Easter, the idle church will be swept to destruction, but the watching ones will see and understand what is coming and warn, warn others and lead to safety. Now, later in this um, teaching, in one of the transcripts, she is very clear. I think it's even in this first one that she's very clear that she believes it's Easter of this year, which is March 31st, 2024. So that's just a little over two months away. Although Christine does not get into this aspect of her vision, I believe that what the vision meant, and I can quickly tell you what I believe it meant, the DNA, we have the DNA of our mother and our father. Our father is Adam. We get our sinful nature, our mortality through Adam. And we sin by nature. It's in our nature to sin. That comes from the part of the DNA we get directly from our father, Adam. The other side of the DNA comes from our mother. And when Christine was given this vision, God showed her that the one side of the DNA in the vision he was given her represented the woman and the man-child of Revelation 12, and the other side represented the dragon. Well, it's because of Adam's sin, and it's because of the temptation by the dragon that deceived Eve that Adam ended up sinning in order to follow her. Somehow, and I don't know how, the dragon defiled Adam's DNA. So 
So this nuclear fission, what God is saying is that he is going to divide the DNA of his overcomers. He's going to take out the dragon nature. But is he going to leave it like that? No, he is going to then put his DNA with the DNA from our mother. Think of it like this. This is exactly what happened when the Holy Spirit impregnated Mary. Jesus had the DNA from his mother, but he had no DNA from a natural father. His DNA came from God himself. And that's why Jesus did not sin. He did not have the sinful nature, the sinful propensity that we do. And so there is a time coming, and it's going to be like a nuclear explosion for his overcomers, where he is going to glorify them. Now in Revelation chapter 12, and I urge you to read that whole chapter, Satan is waiting for the man-child to be born. The woman is pregnant, about to give birth. Satan is waiting, but yet the man-child is born and immediately taken up to heaven. That speaks of glorification. That is the explosion. That's when our DNA, those, those who have been chosen as first fruits, overcomers, those who have been chosen as the man-child, there will be a glorification which God likens to a nuclear explosion here that will change the overcomer's DNA and they will then become full sons of God. Now this is prophesied in Scripture and the, and the place that I like to go to to bring revelation about this is John chapter 1. In John chapter 1, of course, this reveals who Jesus is. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Okay, that's, chat, that's verse 1. But then, verses 12 and 13 say this. To all who received Jesus, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. The right to become. It doesn't say that you become a child of God immediately upon coming to faith in Jesus. No, that's when it begins. That's when your walk begins. And that's why Paul said we have to work out our salvation in fear and trembling. Verse 12 again. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Born of God. So when a person is born of God, when the man-child is delivered, when that happens, that will be a glorification. They will suddenly be in immortal flesh. They will be taken up into heaven, instructed, as to what comes next. And then, I believe they are sent back to earth in order to teach the woman in the wilderness. And you look at Revelation 12, and you'll see that the woman flees from the serpent, flees from the dragon, to a place prepared for her in the wilderness for a time, times, and half a time generally interpreted as three and a half years. So, I believe that that is the main, well, one of the main uh, points of her vision. But the second point, major point is this, is that the church will be swept to destruction at Easter. And now I'm going to get into some things that are going to be very uncomfortable for people. God's wine of judgment. 
God brings judgment to his own people before he judges the world. The holy ones, the Kodeshim, those who will be chosen as the man-child, and I believe the woman, those who will be chosen as the bride of Christ, have been sorely pressed by judgments of sickness and the scarcity of God's word for the last four years at least, four to five years. I want to go to a few verses. Let's first go to Isaiah 51, verse 17. Wake yourself, wake yourself. Stand up, O Jerusalem. New Jerusalem. This is speaking of the overcomers and those who would become part of New Jerusalem. This is not speaking about old Jerusalem that is in chaos today. Wake yourself, wake yourself. Stand up, O Jerusalem. You who have drunk from the hand of I am the cup of his wrath, who have drunk to the dregs, the bowl, the cup of staggering. God, judgment begins in the house of God, the scripture says. And so he judges his faithful first. But coming very soon, is coming the judgment of his unfaithful church and then judgment upon the world. Then going to verse 21, 21 through 23 of Isaiah 51. Therefore hear this, you who are afflicted, who are drunk, but not with wine. In other words, not with uh the wine you would go to the grocery store, the liquor store to get. Thus says your Lord, I am your God who pleads the cause of his people. Behold, I have taken from your hand the cup of staggering. The bowl of my wrath you shall drink no more. So there is shortly coming a time, an ending, an ending of the time of the judgment upon us, the judgment upon our flesh and of not being able to even hear the Spirit. There's coming an end very soon. And I will put that cup into the hand of your tormentors who have said to you, bow down that we may pass over. And you have made your back like the ground and like the street for them to pass over. So the power of the holy people has been totally destroyed, and that describes where we are today. People walk on our backs and destroy us, abuse us and abuse our rights. We have no rights. They do with us as they want. Then Psalm chapter 60, verse 1 through 3. O God, you have rejected us. You have broken our defenses. You have been angry. Oh, restore us. You have made the land to quake. You have torn it open. Repair its breaches, for it totters. You have made your people see hard things. You have given us wine to drink that made us stagger. Wine that makes us stagger. We are staggering through what they've done to us right now. We are staggering from the diseases they have unleashed upon us for many years and especially beginning at the end of 2019 with COVID-19. We are staggering from what they have released upon us. And then Revelation chapter 18, verse 6, says this. This is dealing with, now this is going to what is coming next. The judgment upon Babylon the Great. Pay her back as she herself has paid back others. And repay her double for her deeds. 
Mix a double portion for her in the cup she has mixed. So this cup of judgment is going to have to be drunk by Babylon the Great. And let's go to chapter 17, verse 1, and read from there about Babylon the Great. So one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls of wrath came and said to me, Come, I will show you the judgment of the great prostitute who is seated on many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed sexual immorality, and with the wine of whose sexual immorality the dwellers on earth have become drunk. And he carried me away in the spirit into a wilderness. And I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast that was full of blasphemous names, and it had seven heads and ten horns. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and jewels and pearls, holding in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and the impurities of her sexual immorality. And on her forehead was written a name of mystery, Babylon the Great, mother of prostitutes and of earth's abominations. And I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints, the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I marveled greatly. When John saw her, he marveled greatly. And the angel said to him, why do, why do you marvel? I'll tell you the mystery of the woman. And I've been through this many times, but I believe the reason he marveled is because he saw the church at the end. And he thought, oh my God. What I and my brother disciples have begun, or what we began years ago when Jesus was raised from the dead, what we began at the, at the end at this time is a harlot. Very sad. <clears throat> God's wine of judgment is called the cup. Of staggering. After God has dealt with the sin in our hearts, he will then put the cup into the hand of our tormentors. But the cup is coming to the church first. And so a major part of Christine's word that she released on the 12th of January was that God would sweep away the church at Easter. Okay, so now I wrote that comment in my uh, journal on uh, January 16th. And then right after I wrote that, my wife came to me and told me something. And I'm just going to, uh, I'm just going to read what I wrote so that um, I don't say too much or stray away <clears throat> too much from this. I'll just read directly out of my journal and uh, add a couple things as I need to. And I wrote this down on January 17th, the day after she told me. <clears throat> Shortly after I wrote yesterday's entry concerning God's judgment of his people, my wife told me she had just read about Mike Bickle stepping down from his ministry of leading the International House of Prayer. Several people had stepped forward to accuse him of sexual misconduct including a woman who said they had a three, those two, the woman and Mike, had had a three-year sexual relationship that included, quote, everything except intercourse, close quote, that began when she was 19 years old and he was 42. She said that the relationship lasted from 1996 to 1999. In 1996, I believe that Mike was still the head pastor of um, Metro Vineyard Fellowship. Uh, it was called Kansas City Fellowship, then it was called Metro Vineyard Fellowship. 
then they left the vineyard and I think it began to be called Metro Christian Fellowship again. Then Mike left that ministry and he founded International House of Prayer. And I believe that it was 1999 that he founded International House of Prayer. So it was during those years where he was both pastor, head pastor of Metro Christian Fellowship. And then as he was founding International House of Prayer, that he had a three-year romantic relationship with a 19 to 22-year-old woman during that period of time. So, you know, from 19 to age 22. Now, this news hit us hard, my wife and me, because we have personally known Mike since 1978. We attended New Covenant Fellowship from 1978 to 1986. At the beginning of that time, Mike uh, was one of the pastors there at um, New Covenant. Um, I think it was around 1981, he went and founded a church uh, that was south of there in South County, St. Louis, South St. Louis County. And then I believe it was 1983 that Mike moved to Kansas City and then um, founded Kansas City Fellowship. Now, interestingly, we left New Covenant Fellowship in 1986 moved to Virginia Beach where I went to law school for three years. And as we prayed about where to move to, in answer to, I believe, my wife's prayer, she had prayed, Lord, show us the church. In 1989, as we prayed about that, we, uh, I, I ended up writing Mike Bickle a letter for some reason and then he actually called me on Mother's Day in 1989. We talked, and then I went out in a wilderness area and prayed for the day about what we should do. Because school, we were, we were done with our classes, and we had to now decide what to do, uh, where to live. The only, the only state I could even practice law in at that time was Virginia. But we decided to move to Kansas City and didn't know what the Lord would have for us to do. I ended up actually taking the bar that year, passing it, practicing law, <clears throat> until uh, two years ago, when COVID had hit me so hard I had to retire. Now we, so we moved to Kansas City, became members of the church, I actually became an elder in that church. I believe those years were, were from 1991 to 1993. In 1993, some horrible things began to happen at that church with little babies dying or accidents happening that rendered them um, vegetables, basically. I remember one account of that and then another uh, of a who was considered a prophet of his child dying. And also in 93, one of our friends shared a dream that she had had. And the dream was of a trash truck truck backing up to the church, which was Metro Vineyard Fellowship at that time, and dumping its trash into the church. Well, Also in 1993, my wife wrote a letter to Mike Bickle to say that God had written the word Ichabod over his church. The word Ichabod means God has departed or the glory has departed. The combination, well, there was no real response, you know, no kind of a response response of repentance from Mike with regard to that. We had already seen things that made us feel that things were not right there with respect to what they said were spiritual things 
We don't think they were. We think that they were manifestations of demonic. We had indications of sexual immorality going on with people who were part of the school, which was a high school there. And we had a daughter who is uh, who turned 12 in 1993. And so we said, it's, it's time to leave. And we left. After we left, God gave me 10 to 20 dreams concerning Mike. I remember at least one that included his wife, Diane Bickle, in it. That left us no doubt that Mike's church was a type of the church of Thyatira in which dwelt the teachings of Jezebel and the, and the sexual immorality that goes with that church. In fact, one of the dreams I remember Mike was laying in a bed and looked deathly sick. And then I remember two women coming up to the bed and they almost seemed wraith-like. And I thought at that time, oh, these women are seducing Mike and they have him in a bed of sickness. Well, if you remember in Thyatira, the judgment is, I will throw you into a bed of sickness if you do not repent. There's one other thing I should add because it is important uh, regarding our testimony. Mike was the pastor we chose to marry us in 1978. The accusations against Mike do not surprise us, but the reality of his fall and the soon destruction of the established churches break our hearts. The church, the established church, is the epitome of the harlot of Revelation 17, Babylon the Great, whom God has called the head of the eighth beast to destroy. And so, and I'm not going to leave this with Mike. There's a person who uh, has a ministry of reporting the truth in an attempt to restore the church. It's called the Roy's Report. A woman named Julie Roy's does the investigations and she has put a number of reports on her website. And I'll put a link to her website because uh, one of the statements that I read concerning the allegations against Mike Bickle are found on this site. But just to give you, I mean, I don't know some of these, but I know a lot of them. Here's just a short list of the people that she has exposed in her reporting. Andy Wood of Echo Church, John MacArthur of Master's Seminary, Ravi Sakarias, Mark Driscoll, Hillsong, Hillsong Ministry, Bethlehem Baptist Church, College, Seminary, James McDonald of Harvest Bible Chapel, Liberty University, Jerry Falwell, his son, the Vineyard, Willow Creek Community Church, Classical Conversations, Christianity Today, Wheaton College, Moody Bible Institute, Matt Chandler of Acts 29, Brian Loritz, Cedarville, Ark Church of the Highlands, ECFA, Calvary Church of Naperville, Evangelical Industrial Complex, John Course and Applegate, Calvary Chapel, Albert Tate of Fellowship Monrovia, 
Chai Alpha, Daniel Silvalla, and Judah Smith, and Church Home. So I will put a link to that because I'm not singling out Mike. I have known of the egregious nature of many, many people who call themselves by the name of Christ for many years. But I need to read you some more scripture dealing with how serious this is. Ezekiel 13, verse 1. The word of I am came to me, son of man, prophesy against the prophets of Israel who are prophesying, and say to those who prophesy from their own hearts, Hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord I am. Woe to the foolish prophets who follow their own spirit and have seen nothing. Your prophets have been like jackals among ruins, O Israel, O church. The church is prophetic Israel. You have not gone up into the breaches or built up a wall for the house of Israel, for the church, that it might stand in battle in the day of I am. They have seen false visions and lying divinations. They say, declare as the Lord when the Lord has not sent them, and yet they expect him to fulfill their word. Have you not seen a false vision and uttered a lying divination? Whenever you have said, declare as I am, although I have not spoken. Therefore, thus says the Lord I am. Because you have uttered falsehood and seen lying visions, therefore behold, I am against you, declares the Lord I am. My hand will be against the prophets who see false visions and who give lying divinations. They shall not be in the council of my people, nor be enrolled in the register of the house of Israel, nor shall they enter the land of Israel. In other words, they're not going to make the first resurrection. They're not going to be the man-child. They're not going to be the bride. And they're not even going to be guests at the wedding. Then you shall know that I am the Lord God. Precisely because they have misled my people, saying peace, when there is no peace, and because when the people build a wall, these prophets smear it with whitewash. Now let me take you back a little bit again. It was around 92. I asked Mike Bickle, I said, Mike, why don't you ever preach the law? I was an attorney then, and I was even chosen as an elder because of my expertise in the law and with respect to matters of justice. So I said, Mike, why don't you ever preach the law? And he just looked at me and said, because the people are too cranky to hear it. The people are too cranky to hear it? Did he mean I'm too cranky to hear it? I have things I want to do, and if I hear the law, I can't do them? Precisely because they have misled my people, saying peace, when there is no peace. And because when the people build a wall, these prophets smear it with whitewash. Say to those who smear it with whitewash that it shall fall. There will be a deluge of rain. The flood that Christine saw, perhaps. And you, O great hailstones, will fall and a stormy wind break out. And when the wall falls, will it not be said to you, Where is the coating with which you smeared it? Therefore, thus says the Lord, I am. I will make a stormy wind break out in my wrath. And there shall be a deluge of rain in my anger and great hailstones in wrath to make a full end. And I will break down the wall that you have smeared with whitewash and bring it down to the ground so that its foundation will be laid bare. When it falls, you shall perish in the midst of it, and you shall know that I am, I am. Thus will I spend my wrath upon the wall and upon those who have smeared it with whitewash. And I will say to you, the wall is no more, nor those who smeared it, the prophets of Israel who prophesied, the prophets of the church who prophesied concerning Jerusalem, 
who prophesied concerning being spiritual, who prophesied concerning becoming part of New Jerusalem, who prophesied about being the bride and saw visions of peace for her. When there was no peace, declares the Lord, I am. And you, son of man, set your face against the daughters of your people who prophesy out of their own hearts. Oh, the daughters, like maybe the two that were around the bed where Mike was in the dream I had who prophesy out of their own hearts, prophesy against them and say, thus says the Lord I am. Woe to the women who sew magic bands upon all wrists and make veils for the heads of persons of every stature in the hunt for souls. Will you hunt down souls belonging to my people and keep your own souls alive? What else? How else can you describe what happened to young virgins who went to IHOP and then were defiled by leadership. What can you say? Were not their souls hunted? Were not their souls defiled? Because you have disheartened the righteous falsely, although I have not grieved them, and you have encouraged the wicked that he should not turn from his evil way to save his life. Therefore, you shall no more see false visions nor practice divination. I will deliver my people out of your hand, and you shall know that I am, I am. Then certain of the elders of Israel came to me and sat before me. This is chapter 14 of Ezekiel now. And the word of I am came to me. Son of man, these men have taken their idols into their own hearts and set stumbling block and set the stumbling block of their iniquity before their faces. Should I indeed let myself be consulted by them? Therefore speak to them and say to them, thus says the Lord I am. Anyone of the house of Israel who takes his idols into his heart and sets the stumbling block of his iniquity before his face and yet comes to the prophet, I am. The Lord will answer him as he comes with the multitude of his idols, that I may lay hold of the hearts of the house of Israel, who are all estranged from me through their idols. This is why judgment is coming to the church. The church has to repent. Those who are faithful, she who will become the bride, and the others who will become the guests at the wedding will flee the church and will flee into the wilderness in order to be taught by the overcomers. And that is about to happen. 14.6 of Ezekiel, Therefore say to the house of Israel, say to the church, Thus says the Lord I am, Repent and turn away from your idols and turn away your faces from all your abominations. For anyone of the house of Israel or of the strangers who sojourn in Israel who separates himself from me, taking his idols into his heart and putting the stumbling block of his iniquity before his face, and yet comes to a prophet to consult me through him, I, the Lord, will answer him myself, and I will set my face against that man, and I will make him a sign and a byword and cut him off from the midst of my people, and you shall know that I am the Lord. And if the prophet is deceived and speaks a word, then I, the Lord, have deceived that prophet. And I will stretch out my hand against him, the prophet, and I will destroy him from the midst of my people, Israel. And they shall bear their punishment. The punishment of the prophet and the punishment of the inquirer shall be alike. That the house of Israel, that my church, Israel speaks of the church, may no more go astray from me, nor defile themselves any more with all their transgressions, but that they may be my people and I may be their God, declares the Lord, I am. And now, Ezekiel 16, verse 1. Again, the word of the Lord came to me, Son of man, make known to Jerusalem her abominations. And say, thus says the Lord I am to Jerusalem. He 
here we would speak of natural Jerusalem because it's those who, by the way, the church that Mike Bickle comes from, they support Israel and Israel's Zionism. And I've spoken against the Zionist agenda. Son of man, make known to, Jer to Jerusalem her abominations and say, Thus says the Lord I am to Jerusalem. Your origin and your birth are of the land of the Canaanites. Your father was an Amorite and your mother a Hittite. And as for your birth, on the day you were born, your cord was not cut, nor were you washed with water to cleanse you, nor rubbed with salt, nor wrapped in swaddling clothes. And then he goes through in chapter 16, verse 15. Chapter 16, verse 15. But you trusted in your beauty and played the whore. Because of your renown, see the church is rich. The church is renowned. Because of your renown and lavished your whorings on any passerby, your beauty became his. Then Ezekiel 18. Now, Verse 21. If a wicked person turns away from all his sins that he has committed and keeps all my statutes and does what is just and right, he shall surely live. He shall not die. None of the transgressions that he has committed shall be remembered against him. For the righteousness that he has done, he shall live. See, this is the gospel. If you repent, you will live. Repent and believe in Jesus and then begin to obey the word, the obedience of faith. And then God says this, verse 23 of Ezekiel 18. Have I any pleasure in the death of the wicked, declares the Lord I am, and not rather that he should turn away, that he should turn from his way and live? Now listen to this, because see, this applies to Mike Bickle, and this applies to to others who have committed the same egregious sins over and over and over again, who have defiled souls within their church. But when a righteous person turns away from his righteousness and does injustice and does the same abominations that the wicked person does, shall he live? None of the righteous deeds that he has done shall be remembered. For the treachery of which he is guilty and the sin he has committed, for them he shall die. This is the reason for the second death, children of God, that the church does not understand. There are people in the church, people who call themselves Christians, people who are considered great leaders in the church, who will die in the second death. Their souls shall be converted. Verse 25, yet you say the way of the Lord is not just. Hear now, O house of Israel. Hear now, O church. Is my way not just? Is it not your ways that are not just? When a righteous person turns away from his righteousness and does injustice, he shall die for it. For the injustice that he has done, he shall die. Again, when a wicked person turns away from the wickedness he has committed and does what is just and right, he shall save his life because he considered and turned away from all the transgressions that he had committed, he shall surely live. He shall not die. Yet the house of Israel says the way of the Lord is not just. O house of Israel, O church, are my ways not just? Is it not your ways that are not just? <clears throat> Therefore I will judge you, O house of Israel. Every one according to his ways, declares the Lord I am. Repent and turn from all your transgressions, lest iniquity be your ruin. Cast away from you all the transgressions that you have committed, and make yourselves a new heart and a new spirit. Why will you die, O house of Israel, O church? For I have no pleasure in the death of anyone declares the Lord I am. So turn, repent, and live. Finally, 
I will close with this scripture, but it's a long one. So listen, this is 2 Peter chapter 2. <clears throat> but false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you, who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them. To deny means to contradict, even contradicting Jesus, bringing upon themselves swift destruction. And many will follow their sensuality. And because of them, the way of truth will be blasphemed. Is not the way of truth blasphemed by people who abuse those in their care? And in their greed, they will exploit you with false words. Their condemnation from long ago is not idle and their destruction is not asleep. For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to chains of gloomy darkness to be kept until the judgment, if he did not spare the ancient world but preserved Noah, a herald of righteousness with seven others, when he brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly, if by turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to ashes, he condemned them to extinction, making them an example of what is going to happen to the ungodly. And if he rescued righteous Lot, greatly distressed by the sensual conduct of the wicked, for as that righteous man lived among them day by day, he was tormenting his righteous soul over their lawless deeds that he saw and heard. If he can do these things, then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials and to keep the unrighteous under punishment until the day of judgment, and especially those who indulge in the lust of defiling passion and despise authority. Bold and willful, they do not tremble as they blaspheme the glorious ones, whereas angels, though greater in might and power, do not pronounce a blasphemous judgment against them before the Lord. But these, like irrational animals, creatures of instinct, born to be caught and destroyed, blaspheming about matters of which they are ignorant, will also be destroyed in their destruction. Suffering wrong is the wage for the wrongdoing. They count it pleasure to revel in the daytime. They are blots and blemishes, reveling in their deceptions while they feast with you. They have eyes full of adultery, insatiable for sin. They entice unsteady souls. You mean like 19-year-old girls who are sent to what their fathers think is a safe place to learn how to worship God? They entice unsteady souls. They have hearts trained in greed, accursed children. Forsaking the right way, they have gone astray. They have followed the way of Balaam, the son of Beor who loved gain from wrongdoing, but was rebuked for his own transgression. A speechless donkey spoke with human voice and restrained the prophet's madness. These people are waterless springs and mist driven by a storm. For them, the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved. For speaking loud boasts of folly, they entice by sensual passions of the flesh those who are barely escaping from those who live in error. They promise them freedom, but they themselves are slaves of corruption. For whatever overcomes a person, to that he is enslaved. For if after they have escaped the defilements of the world through the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overcome, the last state has become worse for them than the first. For it would have been better for them never to have known the way of righteousness, Then after knowing it to turn back from the holy commandment delivered to them, what the true proverb says has happened to them. The dog returns to its own vomit, and the sow, after washing herself, returns to wallow in the mire. Am I saying that Mike Bickle and the others that have committed similar sins or worse are going to ultimately lose their salvation? No. The scripture says they will have their part in the lake of fire. They will be purged of their sin. But they will lose reward. They will not be part of the first resurrection. 
that you see in Revelation chapter 20. And they certainly will not be part of the glorification of the man-child and the glorification of the bride. Within a <clears throat> couple of days of hearing <clears throat> hearing about the fall of our old fallen friend, Mike Bickle, I wrote a song. It's called A True Man. And here's the words. How can I tell you? How can I make you understand? How can I tell you? How can I be a true man? I weep for you. I cry myself to sleep. I pray for you. I pray your soul he'll keep. How can I tell you? How can I make you understand? How can I tell you? How can I be a perfect man? The church is about to be swept away.